today I'm going to talk, be talking about uh, robust end-to-end -end driving. <clears throat> My research group is focusing on one part on core computer vision problems um, and on another part on integrating this with robotics more recently. And uh, what that means is integrating it um, in the loop, uh, integrating it on policy. Um, for a long time, um, in the beginning, beginning of computer vision, computer vision was very much tied to robotics, but then for a long time, um, computer vision became really big and became its own field. And for a long time, computer vision and robotics deviated a little bit from each other. But then over the last 10 years or so, people realized that it's actually, you can't just look at uh, computer vision problems independently and hope that this will solve your downstream task like self-driving, but you really have to tackle these problems jointly. And that's what our focus has been shifting to recently. So it's it's a uh, it's great that you mentioned the kitty data set. I'm not talking about the kitties data set today. It's 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 uh, it's a reasonable data set. It should probably be uh, replaced by something else by now. But it's a static data set. It's a data set that we have recorded, um, we have uh, made available, we have made these benchmarks available with certain tasks. Um, but doing well on kitty doesn't mean that you can do self-driving well, and that's the storyline here for this talk. So what, if we talk about self-driving, what are the typical approaches to self-driving? Well, there's two dominating paradigms. The first is this, what I call a model of pipeline, where you have a sensory input signal, let's say a camera, could also be multiple different sensors, LiDAR, et cetera. And then you have a pipeline of different processing modules like low-level perception, scene parsing, path planning, vehicle control, um, and possibly more, this is just a very simplified uh, illustration here, um, that processes step-by-step step this information, this high dimensional signal and uh, compresses it, condenses it down to this very low dimensional, very semantic navigational uh, or steering and uh, braking commands, right? Now, this is a very difficult mapping and, and that's why it's typically broken down. And another reason for breaking it down is that it's, if it's very modular, you can, have large teams in industry, this is the dominating approach, you can have large teams uh, splitting up into uh, teams for these individual modules. Now, another advantage of this is that it's very interpretable. You can look at these modules, you can judge what they're doing, um, you can really understand them, that's great. But on the downside, um, this establishing this pipeline requires a lot of expert decisions and it, it's not necessarily true that these decisions that you're doing here are um, the uh, correct ones. And furthermore, in practice, what's often done is that this um, system here is not trained end to end for the downstream task of driving with respect to metrics that you would like to train for like comfort and safety and not colliding with anything um, uh, and maybe time to the goal, but it's uh, trained with a lot of auxiliary losses. For instance, there's an auxiliary loss for semantic segmentation or an auxiliary loss for path planning. Some of these models might be um, actually uh, even uh, hand engineered modules are not trained. Um, so it's a, it's a composition of different modules that are trained independently. And there is no guarantee that this will work really well for the downstream task. And in computer vision, well, um, these hand engineered systems, uh, if you think of like the famous example is maybe SIFT, uh, a system that is also a pipeline that, that composes different engineered modules together. These have been kind of superseded by end-to-end -end trained models these days. And so it's natural to ask, well, can we do this um, using a, a neural network that directly takes the sensory input and maps it to the um, output, the steering and gas and brake. And uh, there's different paradigms for training this. One is imitation learning, we'll talk about today, another is reinforcement learning. And the advantage of this is, well, it's, it's very simple. It's a very generic structure, um, but because it's so generic, it can't really generalize very well, right? And uh, it needs a lot of data. It's very data hungry. And also it's not very interpretable. Um, but what, what we believe is that ultimately, when, when we talk about uh, self-driving that, that can generalize well to new environments, that doesn't rely so much on HD maps and uh, things that people are using currently, um, I, I think we have to go towards this direction and understand these models better. So what is imitation learning? Imitation learning is, is, uh, is essentially supervised learning in order to 
um, train the policy that maps the image to the steering and uh, the gas commands, right? Um, the motivation here is, well, hard coding policy is difficult, so we follow instead a data-driven approach. Um, and we do this by taking an expert driver, so we mount a camera on a car, and we take that car, uh, we drive that car through a city and record both the images as well as the uh, steering uh, commands. Um, so we, we take, a, we basically create by driving a, a labeled and annotated data set of input and outputs. Um, and then we have a simple supervised learning problem where we try to directly regress from the images to the steering commands. And then we uh, apply this as a test time. So the goal um, is to train this policy to mimic the decision of the expert. And one of the state-of-the-art approaches for that, at least in the simulator that we're considering and that you're going to see a lot of videos from the Kala simulator, is uh, conditional imitation learning, CLRS, um, which is a very simple model. It is basically such a, such a, a big, big neural network that takes in the camera image, then also a, a speed signal. It's only taking in a single camera image, so it's advantageous to know also the current speed. Um, and then it's predicting the speed as well, uh, which is uh, acting as a regularizer, but then also the vehicle controls and additional input that's taken in uh, uh, to this neural network is the navigational commands. Because if you are at the intersection, then there's multiple possibilities. So you need to know where you want to go at the next intersection. This is kind of, you can think of this as a GPS um, signal, a GPS system that tells you at the next intersection, turn right, for example, or go straight. And this is provided by the simulator, when you run the simulator and you want to test your algorithm or your policy, then you get this navigational command like a GPS signal. So you need to condition your driving policy. Otherwise, of course, your vehicle doesn't know where to go. Now, the limitations of this approach, which was state of the art till 2019, is um, well, it doesn't generalize very well and has a very high sample complexity. So it needs a lot of data for training. And it's also not very interpretable. And there's actually a lot of situations where where it just fails because driving is hard, even in the simulator. So this is a, some examples from the Kala simulator, just to get a feeling for how difficult it is. It's of course not the real world, but the simulator is getting better with every iteration. Um, it's a great effort. It's a collaboration between uh, Intel and, and Barcelona, and it's, it's getting better every year. And it, it has all kinds of uh, complexities in terms of other dynamic objects that are interfering uh, with the ego vehicle, in terms of the environmental conditions, it has traffic lines that you need to respect, uh, etc. And there's a lot of things that can actually go wrong. So here's some examples from this Seiler as baseline, where I've cherry picked examples that go wrong, where it's just uh, colliding with other vehicles. Then here, in this case, it's, it's standing still because it identifies some shadows or some reflections for a pedestrian on the road. It's not advancing any further. Here it uh, crosses the red light and crashes into the vehicle. Sometimes it goes off the road, or uh, there's some um, uh, some people hurt. Luckily, we're just in a simulation here. Um, so uh, the question um, that we asked, and well, how can we learn a policy that drives under this vast diversity of all visual planning and control scenarios? Um, and this was the idea for our situational driving approach. Um, so we took inspiration from this world models paper by uh, Jürgen Schmidhofer's group, um, where they showed in very simple um, OpenAI gym environments um, how to train a generative model of the environment. So the idea is to first train a, a simulator for the environment. In this case, a variational autoencoder that takes this uh, bird's eye view of the uh, of the car, or in this case here of this doom environment. So it takes an image and tries to reconstruct that image through this bottleneck compression with the latent code. And uh, then once this um, compression model has been trained here, we can encode any input image into a latent code C. And then what they do is they train basically uh, a dynamics model that tries to uh, learn the dynamics in that latent space. And uh, so it's a very low dimensional latent space here compared to the input image. And they learn a control model 
using a um, evolutionary strategy. Now, um, we tried this out uh, for Kala, which has much uh, uh, higher complexity, much higher level of fidelity, and it just doesn't work uh, like that for Kala. It doesn't give any, any improvement uh, with respect to the imitation learning baselines. And so what we then tried is to combine this idea with imitation learning. And this is what we call situational driving, and this is a CBPR paper from last year. So what we do, instead of just operating in this latent space, is we also learn um, imitation learning experts via imitation learning. And we don't learn just a single expert, but we learn a whole bunch of different policy experts that later on we can combine. Um, and the idea is that these policies, these different expert policy, policies adapt to the different uh, situations of driving, such that no single policy has to cover all of the different modes of driving. Um, in the second step, we learn this general purpose context embedding, similar to the world models paper. Um, and then we retain only the encoder so that we can compress this input image into this latent code representation. We use a beta VAE for that. And then in the third step, we perform task driven policy refinement by interacting with the simulation. And we also found this to improve. So the, this, these two steps here are basically uh, pure supervised uh, uh, training. And here we're doing uh, uh, reinforcement learning, or in, in our case, uh, we're using also um, CMAES um, to do on policy learning, right? So the difference is here we have a static off policy data set, and here we do uh, training in the loop with the simulator. Um, of course, we can't do this uh, uh, due to the credit assignment problem. We can't back propagate to all the parameters in our big model. So we just do this for the readout layer. So we pre train these this experts, they are already pretty capable. And we pre-train this context embedding, and then we learn to combine them. This is basically this uh, linear combination of the different experts with the mixture weights and uh, this context embedding with these weights here. Um, yeah, so the steps of, of training are in the first step, we learn the mixture of expert. In the second step, we learn the context embedding. Um, and in the third step, we do task-driven optimization uh, by defining uh, rewards and uh, training the readout layer of this entire model. Um, this is what is indicated here by FITA uh, readout using a reward-based optimization where the reward is as usual in reinforcement learning is specified manually. Um, and of course, it depends a lot on how you actually specify the reward. It includes, in our case, things like avoiding infractions and, and reaching the goal quickly and, and, and so on. Okay, so um, here are some results. Um, this is the Kala environment that we test our system on. This is from the previous version of the simulator. Now there's a new simulator with more towns, but in um, uh, 2019, 2020, there was uh, two towns. There was a training town where we train our models, and then there's a test town where we, which is held out, which we basically use only for testing. And it, uh, an agent is evaluated um, by choosing a random start and end location in this town and then tasked to move from the start to the end location with um, four bevers that have been observed during training and two unseen bevers. And the metric that is used for measuring success is the percentage of successfully completed episodes. In other words, it's the success rate. Um, but in this simple version of the simulator, collision doesn't even uh, necessarily terminate an episode. In later versions of the Kala simulator, they use better metrics. Um, we, ha we have also um, tested on so-called Kala no crash benchmark, which was introduced later. And it's basically the same town, the same simulator, just it has um, a varies the level of dynamics uh, that happens in the scene. You can see on the left, this is an empty city without any dynamic agents. Here in the middle is a regular density of dynamic agents. And here on the right is uh, the dense setting where we have in total 220 agents um, distributed over the entire city. So this is the most challenging scenario. And in, in this case, uh, actually collisions uh, for this benchmark, collisions also terminate the episode, which makes sense. So if you have a collision, you're, you're not successful. 
Um, in addition to this, we have enriched this set of benchmarks with the so-called Kala Any Weber benchmark, where we tested on more Weber's because generalization is to a different Weber situation is really challenging. We wanted to see how far these agents can generalize by training just on these Weber's here and testing on all of these Weber's here on the bottom. You can see the diversity here. Yeah, so we tested a very uh, various aspects of this model. Um, the first thing that we wondered about is, well, how important is this mixture model? Is it actually important to have a mixture of multiple components? And it turns out it's important. If we have just a single component and train only on static environments without dynamic objects, it works really well on static environments, but it fails expectedly for dynamic environments. Um, on the other hand, if we have a dynamic model with just a single expert uh, k equals one then this handles dynamic scenes better but degrades on static scenes because it, a single expert cannot capture the diversity of situations again this is the idea of this situational driving and then in the uh, last setting here we have a dynamic mixture model that generalizes now better to all scenarios higher is better 100 percent is all episodes, all test episodes have been successfully completed. Now, um, we also wondered, well, this was without the task-based re refinement. This was only with uh, off-policy data. Now, what happens if we, we can actually put this agent into the environment and learn using these rewards? Um, and it turns out that you can get a slight improvement with these rewards uh, by 4% success rate here. And uh, the performance also improves. What we also tested here is, um, uh, again, uh, the, uh, the different number of uh, mixture models. And uh, also in this case, the performance improves with the different number uh, with more mixture models up to three to five mixture models. Um, we, here, what is shown here is uh, a plot that shows um, what the different experts have learned. And this is for the same. Um, uh, for the same state of the environment. So the, all the three experts see the same image, have the same input. And you can see how they come up with uh, uh, different uh, solutions, right? So um, they, are, they, are represent, they, are, they are basically uh, really representing different things. And then uh, the, uh, the environment-based environment condition decides which of these experts to choose for a particular situation. Yeah, um, and so here finally are some results against state-of-the-art methods on the Kala benchmark at the time where we submitted this paper. And yeah, well, of course we are uh, slightly better than the baselines here. Um, using reward-based optimization alone, there's a reinforcement baseline is not sufficient. This is a simpler approach than ours, but it uses also reinforcement learning. In contrast, LSD enables better driving behavior across all tasks. Um, and in particular, in the presence of dynamic objects, we get a large boost here. Uh, and when we use the refinement. Yeah, um, these are the results on the Kala no fresh benchmark. Here, all methods perform worse due to these additional challenges. Um, we can also see that for the very dense scenarios here, even the expert fails. And this is a weakness of the simulator that has been improved in in subsequent uh, versions of the simulator where even the expert that we were using for training our models wasn't able su to successfully complete a significant amount of episodes because there was just too many agents and um, there, was, there was a big traffic jam to not reach um, the goal in time. There was no possibility to actually reach the goal in time. Yeah. Um, on the any Weber benchmark that we have introduced, we realized that um, which tests this generalization to unseen Weber's that all methods can fail even on very simple straight driving tasks, right? Even on very simple straight driving tasks, generalization is still hard due to this um, Weber generalization um, issue. And um, so uh, there's additional work that needs to be done in order to handle these scenarios. I wanna show you some results also qualitatively of how this agent behaves. First, these are results from SILRS, um, the baseline. You 
we try to um, compare this to the situational driving model, which in this case correctly stopped for pedestrians. It doesn't have a notion of traffic lights though. <laughs> so this particular model um, crosses red uh, traffic lights, um, but it tries to stop for vehicles and pedestrians. Yeah, sometimes weird things happen in this simulator. The other agents, the AI of the other agents is, is not particularly um, sophisticated. Okay, so in the second part of this talk, I um, want to uh, talk about like how to collect a better data set, right? We're talking about imitation learning. So imitation learning depends on the annotated data that we have collected. Um, so uh, what we're wondering is, well, how can we collect better data? And in particular, how useful is Dagger, which is an established method um, in particular from um, robotic manipulation environments. Um, but how useful is this for self-driving? Um, so this is again, the slide for imitation learning. Um, so we want to uh, give them demonstrations from a demonstrator. We want to train a policy to mimic these decisions. And uh, the formal definition of imitation learning is as such. Um, we want to minimize a uh, loss function that uh, compares the output of the expert here with the star and the learned policy um, in expectation over the state distribution um, where uh, the states uh, actually depend on the rollout determined by the current policy. Right? Now, what we do in practice, um, what I've shown you before, is actually called behavior cloning. In behavior cloning, um, because this is actually hard to achieve, in behavior cloning, because the states here depend on, on, on the policy, so we cannot collect an off-policy data set. In behavior cloning, we are um, sampling these states from a pre-collected data set. So in this case, the state distribution P star, S is state and A is action. So the state distribution is provided by the expert and only in this case, it reduces to a supervised learning problem. So while in theory, imitation learning um, uh, relies on the, uh, the, the rollout on, on policy data, in practice, what we do is almost always just behavior cloning. And this is exactly the problem that Dagger addresses. Um, behavior cloning makes the IID assumption. So the next state is sampled from the states observed during the expert demonstration. And uh, therefore the next state is sampled independently from the action predicted by the current policy. So what happens if the policy makes a mistake, the actual policy that has been trained makes a mistake. Well, we enter a new state that hasn't been observed before. So it's not part of the data distribution that's created by the expert. And so the agent cannot recover and leads to catastrophic failure. So you can imagine you're driving on a road and you're, you're slightly drifting away from the road. So you're observing images that you have never observed before um, and therefore um, the agent fails, right? And the idea of Dagger, well, of course you can use data augmentation and that's what we use also. You can, you can slightly change the camera uh, viewpoint uh, so you can use standard data augmentation techniques, but the idea of Dagger is now to um, retrain the policy with on-policy data. So the idea is to iteratively build a data set of inputs that the final policy is likely to encounter based on the previous experience. And we query the expert for the aggregate data set. So here's the policy that's trained on a particular data set um, that we have created. We are rolling out that policy in the environment and we are um, based on these rollouts, augmenting this data set with this on policy data. And then we retrain that policy again. And then we are rolling out uh, the agent again, create new data and uh, um, combine that data with the existing data and retrain that policy again on that bigger data set and uh, growing the data set using this aggregation strategy. It's a very successful technique that has been used a lot in particular in manipulation tasks. However, what uh, happens with Dagger is that it can easily overfit to the main mode of demonstrations. And also 
it has a high training variance um, where if you randomly initialize, just uh, you do use a different seed for training your model um, or you randomly order the data, um, the, at evaluation time, the success rate has a, has a large variance. So um, what can be seen from this plot here, which shows the distribution of, um, so here we have the different iterations. This is uh, standard imitation learning, and then this is dagger one iteration, two iteration, three iteration of augmenting this data set. And what you can see here is that uh, if you just use standard imitation learning, because in contrast to manipulation tasks in self-driving, the data set is so biased, you can observe, for instance, that the, uh, the number of frames where we actually break is significantly lower than the number of uh, frames where we go straight or where we steer. In this case, it has already, already been uh, uh, pre-normalized, the data set. Otherwise, you would have even more segments that go straight. Um, but what happens if you, if you now use dagger on this data set is that this distribution doesn't significantly change. So we will always have this very biased data set. And so the idea of um, what we proposed in, in this paper here is um, to combine dagger with a particular sampling strategy such that these critical states that are important for making good decisions um, are appearing more often in the data set um, based on the utility that these states provide to the learned policy in terms of the driving behavior. And while this works, it only works in combination with a replay buffer. So we add a replay buffer, which progressively focuses on the higher uncertainty reaches of the policy state distribution. If we just use the critical states, then the model will very quickly overfit to these critical states and not work well for regular states anymore. Um, we use different sampling strategies in order to make this work. Um, so uh, one is a task-based sampling strategy where we uniformly sample from left, right, and straight um, conditional uh, uh, navigational commands. We have a policy-based sampling strategy where we use test time dropout to estimate the epistemic uncertainty of the agent in order to um, uh, select uh, data points that have a high uncertainty for retraining. And then we have also an expert-based sampling strategy. If you have the opportunity as an assimilator to query the expert, we can also, of course, check how much the action that is predicted by the policy deviates from the expert. We can sample those states more frequently. And if we do that, we can see that from this initial imitation learning where we start, if we successively add more data using the strategy, we get a more equalized distribution of the different states, for example, in terms of brake, steering left, uh, going straight, or steering right. Yes, um, so we tested this on the Carla No Crash benchmark in the dense setting with 220 agents, and we compared it to various baselines with and without uh, data augmentation. So this is only the hard setting here. That's why the numbers are lower than we have seen previously. And what we found is that data augmentation increases the performance um, of all methods, but that dagger overfits quickly um, and this is not better than standard data augmentation, like just modifying the camera viewpoint, uh, doing standard tricks for data augmentation. And instead, um, our model, which is this um, green and the yellow curve, um, is able to increase further with the iterations of this data augmentation strategy. Um, also, we see a significant reduction in collision with dynamic objects here. In red is the CLRS baseline. And uh, here we see collisions with pedestrians and other vehicles. We can see how this is reduced using this data occupation strategy. Of course, this, these two models, the green ones, are exactly the same model as CLRS. It, they're using the same architecture. The only thing that has changed here is the, um, how the data is formed. Um, however, we have a little bit more timeouts here due to less infractions. So we have um, uh, more clocked scenes, if you will, <laughs> because we are, we are uh, not exiting early as the baselines that collide. What we observed is that using this particular strategy, the training variance can be significantly reduced. And this is, uh, this is actually important, in particular when 
evaluating agents. Evaluating agents is much harder than evaluating a standard computer vision task on a static data set because you really have to run the simulator, put your agent into the simulator and you need to run it several times and measure the variance because, and this is well known for, for this type of simulation, if you, um, because the, the variance is relatively large. So you can see that the Siler S variance for a success rate of 14.6 is 3.4. So it's really large. Um, now this is actually the standard deviation, of course. So it's standard deviation of 3.4. And if we're comparing different methods that are typically compared on a leaderboard that are maybe you know, one percentage point apart, but they have a variance of 3.4, that's significant. Now, Decker also has a significant variance, but using this um, uh, critical state aggregation strategy, we were able to, um, well, significantly improve performance, but at the same time also reduce the variance. So the models are more comparable. We've also um, looked at uh, what the model is doing or tried to look at that. Of course, there are still black boxes, so it's hard to look at these models. But what you can do is, of course, you can use standard visualization techniques of deep neural networks. We use Gratcam in this case and visualized attention maps. On the left, you see for two scenes, the baseline, and on the right, the, our approach. And you can see that in these cases, um, our approach focuses more on what intuitively makes sense to focus on like this pedestrian or the traffic light and the road. But this is of course, has to be taken with a grain of salt, these visualizations. And so here are some um, qualitative results. Again, against the cellular space line, always starting at the same location so that you can, starting with the same state so that you can compare the left and the right on a fair, basis. Sometimes it's very hard with the rain and the sunlight coming directly against you. But in this case, so this model has been trained for traffic lights. You can see how it deals to traffic lights, successfully crosses the intersection, stops for vehicles and other pedestrians. In general, it's, it's much more robust than CILRS. Yeah, so finally, the final part of this presentation is about inter good intermediate representations. Um, previously, I've motivated you know, this going towards um, this end-to-end -end models by not having to splitting up the modeler pipeline into many small modules. Now, um, it turns out that, of course, a little bit of modularization is helpful and leads to better uh, sample efficiency and better generalization. And this has been observed not only by us, but by several people before us. Um, for instance, here's a paper by Flutland Coltoon's group um, that appeared in Science Robotics 2019 called Does Computer Vision Matter for Action? And what they did is they analyzed various intermediate representations for driving and other scenarios, uh, other tasks. Um, and they analyzed, for instance, semantic segmentation, albedo, depth, optical flow, in terms of their utility to improve the driving policy. So we're, we're, they're basically trying to first extract from the input image such an intermediate representation, and then from this intermediate representation, uh, have this intermediate representation as an input instead of the original image, have this as an input to the um, or in addition to the original input, have as an input to the driving policy. Now, this is somewhere in between, of course, this very big model of pipeline and the end-to-end -end approach, um, but it's, it's still uh, just a two-step approach. And so what they found is that the intermediate representations actually do improve the results. So computer vision, doing some visual abstraction is actually helpful. And they found consistent gains across simulations and tasks um, uh, where the depth and the semantics, in particular for urban scene, the semantics provided the largest gains. All right, so now this is the diagram that we're looking at. We have a neural network that predicts some intermediate representation, and then we have a vehicle controller that operates on that. 
or a neural network that takes this in as a controller. Um, now, the question is, well, what is uh, the right intermediate modality? Um, there's different options. And uh, in this work here, we focused on semantic segmentation and object detection because these have been previously found to be relevant or most relevant for self-driving in cities. Now, what are the criteria? What is a good visual abstraction actually? Well, it should be invariant. So it should hide irrelevant variations from the policy so that it becomes easier to learn the policy and it becomes more data efficient to train the policy. It should be universal. So it should be applicable to a wide range of scenarios. It should also be data efficient in terms of memory and computation, and it should be label efficient. It should require a little effort to create the annotations that are required. And uh, well, semantic segmentation um, encodes task relevant knowledge, for instance, the road, which is drivable and priors about grouping and can be processed with standard 2D convolutional policy networks. However, the disadvantage of semantic segmentation is that creating the labels is very time consuming. So labeling a single image for the cityscapes data set required the cityscapes creators to uh, about 90 minutes of annotation time. So it takes about one and a half hour to create a pixel accurate dense annotation map for a uh, driving scene image. And uh, so this is what we wanted to challenge here in this IROS paper um, from last year. So we want, wondered, well, is this actually necessary or can we get away with a much less rich annotation? Um, so this is the setup that we're working in. We have an input image for our policy. This is again a conditional imitation learning policy that is um, implementing our controller. Both of these are neural networks. We have this neural network A that creates this abstraction and then we have the policy pi and both are neural networks parameterized with some parameters. Um, and then the policy again takes as input also the um, uh, uh, well, the velocity and the navigational command. Now um, we have these two functions and then composing both of them, of course, yields um, the entire model, which takes then the image as an input and produces the command, which is the steering angle and the uh, throttle. Um, in order to train this, we need uh, different data sets. We need one data set where uh, images are annotated with semantic labels. Um, so we have this pairs of images and semantic annotations. And it's of course very time consuming to get this data set. So we assume we have less of that data available. And then we assume we have another data set where we have images in combination with driving controls. And that's much cheaper to get because we just have to put a camera on a car, drive around, record our controls, or in the simulator, we get it for free. So we assume from for this type here, there's a lot of data available, but for the pixel-wise annotations, we have less data available. And then we train the visual abstra abstraction network A using this semantic data set. And then we apply this network to obtain the control data set. The control data set is obtained by passing the images through this abstraction network and then combining this or concatenating this with the control. And then we train the policy on this control data set. Okay. And so this is the results in a single slide, the results in a nutshell. What we found is that um, actually by annotating less classes and annotating more costly, we can not only reduce the annotation time here from left to right, uh, by over two orders of magnitude. So we are more label efficient, but we can also improve the success rate. So it's, it's not only beneficial to the cost of annotation, but it's also beneficial in terms of the driving policy. And the reason for this, what we found is that if we have a pixel accurate annotation, then the visual world is, is usually very complex. And there's a lot of find details that are modeled in these annotations that are actually not relevant for driving and rather distracting and rather 
consuming capacity from the neural network away from the actual important tasks. And so this is one of these examples that I mentioned in the beginning where um, it's maybe not a good idea to forget about downstream tasks that we have in mind when we wanna train for semantic segmentation, but rather to first think what is actually important and um, do, some, do a systematic study on that in order to come up with the categories and the type of annotations that are actually most meaningful for the policy. So in this case, we used only a small number of classes. We used the road and the road markings, which were useful for the policy. But for instance, for the cars and for the pedestrians, for the traffic lights, we choose, just used bounding boxes for annotating them, which proved completely sufficient for the policy, even proved the policy performance um, while being uh, able to annotate this much, much faster than trying to annotate this pedestrian here, for instance, using a pixel accurate foreground background mask. Good, um, so that was the final part of my talk. Um, in the last two or three slides, I wanna briefly show you an outlook on works that we are currently doing in this area. And one aspect that we are currently looking into is how important is actually attention. Attention has been used uh, very successfully over the last couple of years in natural language processing. And it becomes more and more important also in computer vision. So we're wondering, is it also important for self-driving? And so we have developed a new model that combines attention with an implicit representation of the environment in order to selectively query information from the input images and combine this, iteratively compress this into a compact representation that is then useful for the policy to train an efficient policy. And our model in this case doesn't directly predict um, the controls, uh, steering and um, the throttle, but it predicts waypoints instead and has a little control on top, which in the last uh, uh, year, many approaches pursued because it's uh, leading to better performance. And it's also easier for the model to predict uh, these waypoints in a physical space where all the processing takes place compared to moving between maybe the image domain and a, a physical space like the control domain. And um, yeah, this model can be analyzed, like it, it can be intrinsically analyzed because it uses attention. So we can visualize where the model attends to and we can look at what happens at the intersection, for instance, the model attends to particular uh, vehicles or to particular traffic lights. Um, so the model gains some level of interpretability. I want to show you some very recent results that um, I just obtained yesterday from the student um, here in this video. So this is the driving policy that will just let play for a little while. Um, the policy takes a single image and also a speed signal as an input. Uh, I think there's also a variant which uses three images as input um, and uh, it predicts uh, the waypoint offsets in a, in a dense continuous representation and a bird's eye view semantic representation um, as an auxiliary task. And this is the driving performance that it then attains. You can see it's, it's quite challenging here in this. This is the new color simulator. It has much more Challenge, challenging cities, as you've seen before, with multiple lanes, with roundabouts, um, with a high degree of dynamic traffic participants. And uh, the, uh, the, the agent here successfully stops um, for vehicles in front or for traffic lights. Um, but there's also, of course, a lot of headroom still. So in this new simulator, we are far from solving the simulator. We again have issues with the expert, even the expert um, that has access to privileged information is not able to complete all the episodes successfully. So it's of course a problem for us if we train based on that expert. So that's one thing that we have to improve. But then also in some cases, it's really hard for our model to, for instance, distinguish the state between green and uh, red of traffic lights that are further away or to identify the traffic light that's actually relevant for the eco vehicle.
Okay. So, in summary, <laughs> um, I've tried to convince you that mixture models um, for learning situational driving can significantly improve generalization. Um, that task driven optimization is difficult, um, but important at least to apply to the readout layers. Um, I've shown that data augmentation is important, but can easily overfit um, for self driving, and that these critical states and replay buffer that we introduced improve performance and also are able to reduce variance. Um, by exploiting visual abstractions, we can obtain more robust driving models and more sample and data efficient models. And a higher segmentation accuracy does not necessarily imply better driving. And hybrid representations are able to reduce annotation costs. Here, yeah, hybrid means a combination of bonding boxes and semantic segmentations, for instance. And also these visual abstractions can significantly lower training variance, which is important in particular for comparing different methods, which is a really hard task in this on policy setting in the simulator in the loop. With that, yeah, and, and finally, attention is helpful for self-driving, but it hasn't been explored much yet. And ours are the first baby steps, I feel, but there's a lot to come in this direction as well. So with that, I wanna thank you for your attention. Um, I wanna also point out our blog. Um, we have a research blog where you can find more about our research on more classical computer vision. We do a lot of work on 3D reconstruction, but also this works here on self-driving. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thanks.